Um, for some of you guys who don't know me, my name is Evelyn Lowe, and I'm the International Medical Director. And I'd like to welcome you to our very first Acts of Mercy Life U class. And I know that there are people on this call, some up from across the US. We have our kids and youth, as I mentioned earlier. And this is gonna be the first of five initial trainings to hopefully prepare you with practical information and equip you in case of a disaster, not only for you, but with your family, friends, and neighbors. We'll be recording these teachings and you'll be able to access the video library. Uh, Mary will be able to help you get on that if you happen to miss one of the five. And just a little perk, if you complete all five, we will have a raffle with some cool prizes and Mary will talk about them in the end. I want to also welcome um, all the youth and young adults to this training. And I really encourage you to invite your kids to get involved because they'll be a great help in times of need. I want to introduce to you, Mary Roberts, can you wave? She'll be monitoring the chat. Um, you could send questions to her and in the end, we'll have time for Q&A to answer some of those questions. And also in the end, we'll have a five minute breakout room with our leadership team. Can you all raise your hands, uh, wave your hands as well? And um, I just wanna give you a little bit of vision of what Acts of Mercy and what this ministry is about. We're here to mobilize the church to engage, train and prepare us in order to offer actually practical help in times of disasters and to bring sustainable transformation, not only to our communities here locally, but around the world. And in Matthew 22, Jesus was answering his, um, the teachers, they asked them, which is the greatest commandment? And Jesus replied, love, your, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. And so that's what we wanna do. We wanna equip you and train you to be help in times of need, but also to be able to help your neighbor, to be a lighthouse in your neighborhood. We'll only, not only help you plan, for yourselves, but also how do we engage your community? And actually this class is what we call a pre-CERT class. And CERT stands for Community Emergency Response Team. And you will work in conjunction with your local fire department to provide help when their resources and ability to, to offer help is overwhelmed. So he's manifested or incorporated a thousand volunteers that have served in that capacity. And this year alone, just a few weeks into 2021, he's reported that they've had two volcanic eruptions, severe flooding, an earthquake, and a plane going down. So just in a couple of weeks that we just embarked on this new year, and that has happened. But he's seen so much fruit that's come out of this. I'm just gonna share something that he sent on this newsletter. Um, we help local people envision that tomorrow can be better than today. We assist them in building that new future. We discover people in the midst of disasters who are per prepared by God for a new spiritual reality in their lives. And we commit long-term to help them discover their destiny through the transformation of their community. So what, what an amazing way to evangelize is to be able to help people in their most time, dire time of need. Um, we've had the experience going to the Philippines over the last five years. Unfortunately, last year, because of COVID, we weren't able to do that. But Pia and I have seen the fruit of our being able to go there and impart some of what we know and we, we, we've experienced. And uh, we work with a couple of mission groups over there and the last times we were there, they were showing us pictures of how they responded locally to floods and mudslides. And so this is something that is very near and dear to my heart. And um, it is my sincere hope and desire that these series of classes will inspire you to seek further training. CERT being a program that is excellent. It's taught throughout the nation. And Evelyn talked about CERT. So even though this is not a CERT class, we're going to delve into some topics that will blend well into this disaster preparedness. So uh, the CERT started within uh, LA City under the LA City Fire Department. Um, they identified back in 1985 a need in the event of any major catastrophe or disaster that the citizens of the city would be on their own 
for three to 10 days plus. So they came up with a program, program to teach regular people how to engage and prevent their home from becoming an area that they might get injured after a fire or an earthquake. And they also taught them some basic first aid. And this program became so popular that it was starting to be accepted by different fire departments around the country. Fast forward 1994, uh, FEMA adopted the program and tailored it to encompass a variety of different disasters. So it's now a nationwide program. It's actually taught in different parts of the world, not just in this country. And uh, it is my hope that you guys will seek maybe some further training so that you can help yourselves, your family, your neighbors, and maybe even reach out abroad and, and take some of what you learn to help some of those in need. Um, I'm just gonna play a short video that's gonna give a quick intro and to some of what the training of this class and the further four classes going to encompass. Hi, my name is Pia Hugo, and my husband Albert and I have been part of Epicenter Church for about five years. You know, everyone knows we are living in tumultuous times, whether it's a worldwide pandemic or an earthquake, or how about a wildfire raging right in the next city? Never has there been a better time to be trained in disaster preparedness. As a church, we also need to be ready to provide assistance to whomever might need it, whether it's physical, emotional, or spiritual. You know, my husband, he's been a firefighter for both uh, the Ventura and the LA counties for about uh, actually more than 25 years. So we have put together a series of videos to help you situate yourselves so that you can be better prepared for that next catastrophe. Because let's face it, it's not a matter of, of if, it's a matter of when. So thank you so much for taking the time to watch these videos. We hope you'll be blessed by them. So um, what is a disaster? Uh, the World Health Organization defines a disaster as a serious disruption of the functioning of a community or a society causing widespread human, material, economic, or environmental losses that exceed the ability of the affected community or, or society to cope with on its own. Kind of a complicated uh, definition of a disaster, something a little more simpler. It, it's a sudden event such as an accident or natural catastrophe causing great damage or loss of life. So there could be many definitions to a disaster. Um, my wife Pia might consider a disaster as going down to the local Starbucks and not being able to get her, her favorite chai tea latte. But it's all a matter of perspective. But uh, seriously, it's, it's a different thing depending on where we live. Some of you might live in the uh, desert communities of the Antelope Valley and you're gonna be subject to floods and heavy rainstorms. Some of you might be living in the foothills communities where the brush fires that we get every year, and it's not just one brush fire, it's a number of brush fires, and we respond to those every year. And it seems like every year it's getting worse. So it really depends on where you live. You might live near the South Bay where the, the, the refineries are at, and there's that potential for a refinery fire or an explosion. So, like what Pia says, it's not a matter of if, but when. Southern California being a region where we get the most earthquakes uh, in almost the whole country, it's been predicted that experts predict an earthquake of 7.0 or greater that we're due. It's been a long time since the 1994 Northridge earthquake. So we really want you to keep in mind the different types of things that you might unfortunately encounter but with proper training, understanding and preparation that you, your, your family and yourselves can better survive, but also be able to provide help to those in need. Um, disasters, there's different types of disasters. There's natural disasters. We talked about earthquakes, depending on what part of the country, you could be subject to hurricanes or tornadoes, mudslides, or, or even wildfires like here in Southern California. Um, there's also technological types of disasters, uh, hazardous material spill down the roadway where you're traveling because of a tanker overturning, 
Uh, it could be a nuclear power plant accident somewhere near an area where there is one, or like I said, a refinery fire. Um, there's also what we call intentional or man-made disasters. Those usually fall under the, the realm of terrorism. And that's when they're using some kind of chemical, biological, radiological, nuclear or explosion device, or oftentimes it's a combination of these devices. So it's an unfortunate reality of our society, but this is, is something that we can help prepare in the event that we encounter a situation like that. Now there's different elements to a disaster. Um, one of the yeah. things uh, with disasters, they are relatively unexpected. Um, oftentimes emergency personnel can be overwhelmed and it's gonna be so much of a situation that the first responders may not be able to provide or render assistance for a period of time. Um, there's also damage to infrastructure, transportation, electrical grid can go down, uh, ability to get water, food, or even have shelter and fuel can be severely hampered if not completely impeded. So we just gotta remember that sometimes these disasters will also call, cause environmental or health concerns not being able to have a clean water to drink or uh, some healthy food to eat can become pretty serious in just a matter of days. Um, now, when we prepare for a potential disaster, there's things we can do within the home. Uh, there can be some non-structural things that can occur in your home for a ruptured gas line, um, displaced water lines, so you're not getting water, it could flood your home. Um, you can get damage from falling ceilings, uh, parts of walls of your structure, but there's also the potential for an electrical shock from displaced appliances or electrical equipment in your home. There's also the potential for fire. So in the event of an earthquake, uh, there could be some kind of a short circuit and it could cause an electrical fire. So those are some things that can happen in your home that are non-structural. But there's also some type of structural situations that can occur. Broken glass from windows or uh, decorative features of your home. Um, partial walls collapsing or falling uh, uh, ceiling panels. But there's also walkways and stairways that can be impeded as well. So essentially what I'm trying to impart upon you is that you can impart or you can take what we call impact reduction. So impact reduction could be something as simple as securing heavy pieces of, of furniture in your home, anchoring it. Um, it could be like relocating some decorative mirrors or uh, frames that have glass away from areas that are near some potential exits in the event that you need to exit from your home. So for those of you maybe that live in a second story house and maybe uh, grandmother is situated on the second story. It could be something as simple as relocating her to the first level of your home. In the event that you need to evacuate quickly, how difficult would it be to carry grandmother who maybe uses a walker get down from the stairs? So simple things that we can take and implement before something occurs can provide you with the ability to get everybody out safely but to be able to not only get them out safely and for you to be able to render help to someone else. Um, I'm gonna show you a video that brings this to the point. This is an excellent video simulating an earthquake in the Southern California region. It's a sunny morning in Southern California. Across the region, 7.5 million people are busy at work. Several hundred thousand of them are commuting to jobs in different counties, far from where they live. Over 200,000 commuters work and reside on opposite sides of the San Andreas Fault. Today, these families and many others across the region will be separated.
1,800 people will die. 53,000 people will be injured. And $213 billion in damage will occur. It's 10 a.m. The largest earthquake to hit Southern California in modern times has just begun. Some people react appropriately, others don't. In the intense shaking, nearly 1,500 buildings collapse. Infrastructure is severely compromised and 300,000 buildings suffer significant damage. The rupture travels 200 miles northwest along the San Andreas Fault. Violent shaking lasting as long as two minutes in some areas. Finally, the earthquake is over. Many of the lifelines of Southern California have been disrupted. A large number of people are trapped in collapsed buildings. Over 1,600 fires start, some turning into super conflagrations. Millions of people are trying to use their phones, causing the system to become overloaded. In the months ahead, there will be tens of thousands of aftershocks. Residents will struggle to recover from the earthquake. There will be no water for weeks or months, and no electricity. Traveling from point to point within the city will be extremely difficult, and 255,000 people will be displaced from their homes. We are all in this together. We will suffer the consequences if we don't do our part right now. How quickly life gets back to normal after this disaster is up to you and those around you. Your level of personal preparedness will determine your quality of life after the quake. It's a good idea to have a fire extinguisher, a first aid kit, and enough water for each person in your household to have at least one gallon of water a day for three days. Have an emergency plan. Decide now where you will meet your family after an earthquake. Make sure there's a person out of town you can contact to let your loved ones know that you're okay. Homeowners should be sure to bolt their house to its foundation. Consider whether earthquake insurance makes sense for you as part of your financial plan. Even if you're not a homeowner, you can secure your personal possessions against earthquake damage. Preparedness is not only for the home, but also for business. Be sure that your company has emergency plans for a major earthquake. Empower yourself and your family. Be prepared. So that's a pretty impactful video there, but it really is very realistic. Uh, for those of us that live in Southern California, it's been quite a while since we experienced a significant earthquake. So really the point isn't to scare you. The point is to get you to think of how can I better prepare myself, my family, and situate my house in a way that in the event something does occur, the ability to be safe and get out, as well as minimizing damage to your home, but also the opportunity to maybe help those that didn't date this, that didn't have the opportunity or, or they don't know, know or have the experience or knowledge to be able to do this. So um, we talked about this earthquake and the potential damage that it can cause to your home. So for those of you that may or may not know, uh, we have utilities in the home, those being gas, electricity, and water. How many of you know where those utilities are? How many know even how to shut them off? When we respond to a fire, uh, there's a magnitude of different firefighters assuming different positions. One of the most important ones is securing utilities. So that individual, and I've been on numerous fires, I've, I've done that myself, is making sure you shut off the water, the gas, and the electricity. So doing that is so that in the event something does occur, uh, many people misconstrue that the earthquake is the one that causes the, the, uh, the major part of the damage. But it could be that explosion from that ruptured gas line, or it could be that electrical fire because of some uh, causing of a short circuiting because of that significance of that earthquake. 
So here comes another short video that's going to show you where your utilities may be situated in your home and how you could shut them off. Hey, Albert. Hey, Dennis. Good to see you, man. Good to see you. It's been a while. It's been a while. Come on inside. Good to see you. So I really appreciate Albert uh, coming over. You know, I've been trying to figure out with my family how to get a plan together. You know, in case there's a disaster or something, we're having so many wildfires. So I just want to get like a plan together so that, you know, we could be safe. But, you know, I'm kind of clueless. Where do I start at? I'm glad that you called me, Dennis, and I'm more than happy to help you. And like any kind of an emergency, whether it's a fire or an earthquake, let's let's start with your utilities, gas, electric, and water. Let's let's start with your gas. Okay, that's that's good. I, maybe you can even help me where to find it. I'm not even sure where to find it in this house. So okay, let's, let's go to that. the outside of your okay. house. Okay, Dennis, this right here is your gas meter. Most gas meters are located exterior of the house, either in the rear of the house, sometimes in the front or the sides. Sometimes they're even underneath the house when the houses are older. The thing you want to look for is your feeder line. Your feeder line is this right here. As you can see, it goes from underground, it goes up, and you'll see a valve right here. This is in line. That means it's in line with the... So this is your gas meter. This is a prop. So the things that I want to also in, in, uh, enforce with you guys is to remember when you're dealing with gas, you want to use the proper tool. There's different wrenches out there. This particular wrench is one that I recommend because it's made from a non-sparking material. So you don't want to hit metal with metal and potentially cause a spark when you're dealing with the gas. Identifying your feeder line, this is the one that comes from underground and it goes up. This is your actual valve. As you can see, it runs in line with the plumbing here. To shut it off, these out eyelets here would have to match and it's gonna actually bisect the plumbing. So when we wanna shut this off, I'm gonna place it in here with this my tool and I'm gonna move it. Now it's shut off, it bisects that and you see the eyelets are matching each other. So Albert, if I'm uh, having some type of a disaster or something and the pipe breaks and the water's coming out everywhere, how would I know where to shut off my water at my house? Can you show me? Sure. Okay. There's potentially two ways you can shut your power off. Your house has this exterior here that would shut your water. Just like the gas main, it runs in line with the water. To shut it off, you would turn it and now it's bisecting it. So now this means that it's shut. But there's another valve that you should also know that brings the feeder, feeder main into your house. And I'll show you that one too. So is this normally found in the front of my house? Is that where I would usually find it? Either the front or the sides if you have it, but some houses don't have this. Okay. But it's a good idea to have because it's a quick shut off. So Dennis, this is the exterior valve that you could shut the main, the water coming into your house from the main water feeder line. Okay. And you'll see it, you'll say it's water. It's usually on the, around the, right before the curb on the exterior to your house, most often on the front of it. Okay, so you would need to take this cover off. And what you're looking for is this valve right here. Right now it's open, just like the other valve in the gas valve, it's in line with the pipe. To shut it off, you could have a tool. This is one that you can use. Fit it in here and turn it. Cool. But I recommend, this. These, these valves are hard to manipulate. You get, this is a water valve, bigger. It goes right inside here, just like that. But because it extends further out, you have more force to be able to open it. Because some of these valves haven't been opened in a long time. It might take some effort. Okay, just a, a quick uh, point. When I said open, that water main is open. What I meant to say closed, because the only reason it would be closed if you didn't pay your water bill and the water company came and shut it off. But what I was trying to say is it's already open, but by turning it that way, you want to close it. The electrical panel in my house, um, we're in the garage right now. Why would I need, need to know uh, where this is and what to do with it? 
It's, good. it's a good question. So most of these panels are inside the garage. Sometimes they're exterior to your house. Uh, some important reasons why you would need to do if you're doing some kind of work in your home. Uh, you might want to shut off a particular room or area of your home. But say you have a flooding or you have a roof leak and there's water that compromised into the components, particularly electrical components in your home. You wouldn't want some arcing situation to start a fire. Mm -hmm. So it's a good idea to know where your electrical panel is and what you would need to do to shut it off. The, your panel here, as you have it listed here, this is what we recommend. So you have the, the areas in particular to your home, if you needed to shut off a particular room or area of your house, it's always a good idea to have these marked. Really important. And if you don't, it's pretty simple. It's just you and and your wife or your kids, you know, with your cell phones, just, hey, I'm shutting this off. Which room does not have electrical power? And then you just mark it and start denoting it. You did a good job by doing that. Things that you want to consider before you approach that you look that there's no water or any other potentially dangerous situation. You don't want to mess with water and electricity. So you want to do what I call situational awareness. You want to make sure that it's safe to approach. We're going to determine that that's the case. You're going to identify these are all your switches. Some of these might be different. They may look more and they're being more numerous in this particular prop. What we're going to want to do is do a switch at a time. You don't want to hit them all at once. You don't want to do multiple switches. You want to do one switch at a time. What I like to do is start in one column. Off. 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 Then I'm going to hit my main. Sometimes you'll have electrical panels that have a lever. So this is just one example. What you want to do is make sure you don't hit them all at the same time. And the last one you want to shut off is your main. And the way you could identify it in this one is on the top. Some of them may be identified. Uh, what you want to really remember is that you're going to do one at a time. You don't want to do multiple ones. And you're going to want to make sure that you have a sequence so that you don't do one here and you jump up to this one and you might forget to hit some. Okay, that was really informative video. And it really points out that if you're in a single family home, those are the types of utilities and where they're situated where you can expect to find them. But guess what? Not all of us live in a single family home. We might live in a condominium, in apartment building. So even though you do, you might potentially live in one of those types of uh, structures, you can locate where the water main is you can locate with the gas meters. There are probably a number of gas meters and have an idea where the electrical room is because it's probably, or it's a good chance it might not be a single electrical panel, but it might be an electrical room depending how big and modern that, that structure is in. Um, you saw some of the tools that I was using. Uh, it's really wise to make an investment and have those available. If you so choose to get a, um, a gas meter valve. A uh, suggestion would be that you get one. It doesn't necessarily have to be the ones that I showed you there, but you get one, put it in a couple of Ziploc bags and situate it right by your gas meter. Nothing worse than having the tool, but you didn't place it in an area that you can quickly get to it. But it's not just you knowing it. Show everybody in the household where it is and how to use that tool. Even the kids, it doesn't matter if they're young kids, if they're the only ones there, maybe mom is injured or dad is injured, they can help mitigate that potential uh, um, explosion by shutting that gas off. So it really is a, um, like they say, uh, knowledge is power. This is really where that's really applicable. The more you know, the more you invest in um, some of these tools and training, the more you can situate yourself and your family in a safe situation. Um, Different things also, I wanna point out that uh, it's a good investment to get a seismic earthquake valve. What that is, it's a valve that's actually um, put on by a licensed plumber. And what it will do is in the event of an earthquake, it will automatically shut your gas meter off. So it's one less thing to be concerned about. You gotta be careful though, cause uh, the, where our gas meter is situated, my wife has a number of plants, beautiful. She has a beautiful garden. 
But oftentimes I'm trying to take a shower and it's nothing but cold water coming out because she was gardening and she hit the meter, shut off valve and it shut off. So um, yeah, that was a cold shower for me that day, but uh, I showed her to be careful and where it is. But really, it's a good investment that if you own your home, I would recommend that you make an investment in. Um, there's also a number, another variety of different things that we might experience as an emergency or disaster. So the last video that we're gonna show is a safety that's gonna encompass a, a, a few things that you might experience. Setting up an emergency evacuation plan. A good place to begin emergency preparedness is by writing a family emergency plan. Your plan should include every member of your household. It is important that every member understand where all the exits are, whether they're windows or doors. In the end, a safe meeting place should be identified outside of your home. What to do in the event of an earthquake. During an earthquake, if indoors, stay there. Get under a desk or a table or stand in a corner. Stay away from windows, bookcases, or any heavy pieces of furniture. Remember, drop, cover, and hold on. Cover the back of your head or neck, write the earthquake out, and vacate when it's safe to do so. What do you do if your clothes catches on fire? Cover your airway and stop, drop, and roll. Roll back and forth to try to put that fire out. If there's someone there to assist you, they can use a jacket to help smother that fire and put it out. Make sure all exits are properly functioning. Everyone in your house should be able to unlock every window and door. What to do in the event of a fire in your home. Every home should be equipped with properly functioning smoke alarms. If awoken by a smoke alarm, proceed to the door and with the back of your hand, touch the door and the doorknob. If hot, do not go out that way. Crawl low and notify everyone in the household. Remember to crawl to the nearest exit. It is easy to panic and get disoriented because of the thick, heavy smoke. By keeping low, you are breathing cleaner air. Proceed to the nearest exit. If it's safe to do so, you may stand. If not, crawl out and proceed to go to the area that's identified as a safe meeting place. Remember, do not try to retrieve any valuables. Go to the area and determine that everyone has made it out. Now you can proceed to dial 911 if you have means to do so. If not, ask a neighbor to dial 911 for you. Okay, so that just touched up on, uh, upon a couple of things that we may experience. Um, as you witness Sam uh, putting the back of his hand and going down the door, you want to start high. Smoke and heat rises, and you want to go from the top of the door all the way down, and then you touch the doorknob. Um, the reason we do that is you have three amazing tools that the Lord has blessed you with. You have your mind and your brain, and you have your two hands. If you went for that doorknob and it was hot fire, guess what? You just burned, and most of us will probably use our dominant hand. You just burned the palm of your hand, and now that's one tool that you won't be able to use. So it's some simple techniques that you can learn and show the rest of your family members that can really help it so that in the event there's an emergency, in this case a fire, that you're able to evacuate and be safe and do it safely. Um, what we try to do is look and walk through your home. When you do a disaster evacuation plan, make sure that you cover every window and door. If you have a house situated on a second story or higher, invest on one of those ladders that you can throw out the window. Um, what we try to do is, if at all possible, have two or more than uh, means of exiting. Unfortunately, sometimes in a, in a particular home, you may only have one or two ways of getting in and out. But try to plan it so that in the event something happens, that you have another alternate means to get out. It is human nature. Now, remember, we're talking about being in the home. Uh, right now, we're not able to eat in indoors or go to movie theaters. But when we're able to do so, 
situate yourself, look where the exits are. Human nature is that in the event there's an emergency, we're in a movie theater, we're in the front row. Human nature is you're gonna go out the way you came in. Look at where your exits are. You know, I talked about situational awareness is uh, my wife would always, when we were dating, why are you looking at the exits? Why do you always like to situate yourself sitting where you could see everything from uh, coming in? It's just something that we get ingrained when we go to the fire academy that you, I don't even think about it, I'm doing it. And she knows it now. And it's just something that I've gotten accustomed to because it's something that was drilled into us. Uh, another thing that I wanna point out, you could be in a hotel room, you could be sleeping over your relative's house, so when you go to bed, get in the habit of closing your door. Even a simple hollow core door, which is not a solid door, having it closed can protect you from that super hot air and the smoke, which has very hazardous contaminants once different things start to burn. When you get out and you know where the exit is, put one hand on the wall. It's really easy to get disoriented in the panic state, a hot environment, smoke. So if you know that you should make a left, put your hand and walk out that way, crawl out. I've been in, in situations where even with my protective equipment, I couldn't see the hand in front of me. It was just going down by touch. So if you get and incorporate these little simple um, techniques in the event you're in a situation like that, they could be really helpful. When you saw Sam, uh, when his clothes was catching on fire, I always recommend that you cover your airway. It's not so much to filter out. There's only so much you can filter out with your hands. But guess what? Um, the clothes that we wear are made by synthetic materials. They burn hotter, faster, and they emit very uh, hazardous uh, smoke. So you're protecting your airway and you're, you're uh, limiting the amount of that potential harmful smoke from being inhaled. So um, I know there's a lot of material that we've covered and there's a lot of things that we, we showed. Uh, there'll be other videos that will cover some other material, but also remember when I teach CERT, it's a 24 hour class. So we're encompassing this in, into five classes. So hopefully this will give you an idea of some of the things that you can do and incorporate in your home. And so a couple things that are good to know a couple of things that we are putting together for you all that you've asked very proactively in your questions is a list of resources, such as what to have in your home for a go bag, what different things to have ready, also what tools to buy. Uh, we're going to put together some kind of examples uh, and locations that you can find them. Um, of course, you can do your own research as well, but just to help serve together in our community. So a place that you will be able to find some of these resources are our new webpage at Epicenter. And so epicenter.org slash acts of mercy as one word, uh, you're gonna be able to find a growing library of these resources. So we have some links already there ready to go that you can start with right after this Life You class. Uh, but we're also gonna be continuously adding more and really building a database to serve you all and these questions. And so the more questions you ask, also the more that we can help build together to serve one another. And so under that Acts of Mercy page, you will, you'll be able to click on videos and there you will find our new YouTube channel. And so on that channel has the videos of our very own stars uh, that we have here on the Zoom together. And so you can go through it step-by-step step so you can really learn how to apply uh, what you're watching in the video. And so another resource, I'm gonna put right here, my email for you that you can send um, if you have any other questions or anything, us as an Acts of Mercy uh, lead team can help serve you all in. You may have the contacts for others here as well, but feel free uh, to send questions and we will keep you updated on our next Life U classes. Each one will be different. So building on the content, new things, you can come to as many as you'd like to. Uh, we are gonna start raffling off in our next class, some supplies. So you saw the cool gear that was being used in the videos. Uh, we're gonna start raffling off some of that gear, but don't let it hold you off from waiting to buy it. <laughs> um, there's lots of cool things that you can do when you start gathering up your go bag, your disaster preparedness. And so uh, 
there's cool technology out there. And so don't let it hinder you building your supplies now, but be ready for some cool raffles starting in our next class next month. And so, yeah, that concludes our announcements. Thank you all so much for hopping on. Such a joy to see you all. And if you have questions, please stick around. We're gonna jump right into our Q&A. And so thank you all so much for joining. Hi guys, thanks for coming. Thank you, everybody. Take care, God bless. Mary, will you, uh, who's starting off with questions? Are you gonna start um, listing the questions right now? Great, I'd be happy to go for it. All right, ready, Albert? <laughs> it's like a game. Here's all the questions. See how many points you can get. So if it's a bad earthquake, how do you know if it's safe to go out of your home, such as thinking about aftershocks? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, oftentimes, the initial earthquake can cause a lot of damage, but it's really the aftershocks afterwards. So it really is just as soon as the major earthquake goes and succeed and uh, you know it stops, then that's when you can yell out, "Don't go out! Don't go out from your uh, your protective area." Maybe that 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 uh, particular table where where Sam and Hannah were at. The advice would be to wait. If there's others in the house, yell out if you can, and say, "Hey, we're going to go out." That's why it's important that you develop an emergency evacuation plan. And what you want to do is, is you situate yourself not underneath any power lines, not underneath any big trees. If you live in a high rise, there could be decorative features from the building that can come down, uh, broken glass. Uh, a good rule of thumb, if you are in a situation where it's multi-story type of structure, you do one and a half times the height of the building. So if it's a 30 foot building, minimum, you should be a distance of 45 feet away. So that's a good rule of thumb that we do when we go on a high rise fire. Uh, but essentially is there's really no true way to predict when the next aftershock is gonna come. Wait it out, yell out for everybody. Look around you, I mentioned situational awareness. There's gonna be bro broken glass, uh, furniture, decorative pieces on the ground. Hopefully there's daylight and you can see. Just remember where the things are in your home. We all know when we're at home where our things are. And before you proceed, make sure it's safe. Like I talked about in the electrical panel when you're shutting it off, is there water near there? Water and electricity are a bad mix. So before you commit, assess the situation and then proceed. So with regards to this question, excellent question. There's no true uh, correct answer but I would wait out a little bit, situate yourself, assess where you can go, yell out if you can, and then go to your safe location. Awesome, next question. Uh, what should I do in a fire if I live in an apartment where there's one door exit or a window that goes down two stories in height? Good question there too. Um, a lot of us live in a, in a situation where we're at second floor or up. So um, look online and it's that old adage, buyer beware, do a little research. With regards to these ladders, I don't know of any, but I, I can look up to see if there's some that are, are more recommended than others. Um, but I would start to look and invest into that. Send me what you found and I'll do a, again, a little research to find out. But those ladders, you can um, purchase them and they would be outside a particular window in your home or an area that you have access to. Um, there's different types of models, but uh, you would have to open that window, drop it out. But uh, if the situation is that you can't go out the front door, then your only other means of exiting, if it's a second story or higher, is a, is, is a window. So um, if the situation is you're scared of heights, you're living in an apartment building, you're in the fifth floor, Talk to the manager and say, hey, the moment there's an opening on the first level, I want to go in there. Or look possibly to another location. Some of us don't have that option, but just different things that you can start looking ahead before the situation arises and you're in a, under an emergency or disaster situation. And if we're in an apartment complex, how do we know where to find the things that we need to shut off? 
that's when you, you approach the manager or the custodial engineer and ask them and be concerned when they tell you they don't know. That is something that everybody that is uh, assuming that responsibility should know. And if you can't find, um, reach out to me. Uh, some of you live in different fire department jurisdictions. So if I have the time, I would go there and see if I can uh, find it for yourself. But if you live, say, in uh, Arcadia, you would be under the Arcadia Fire Department. So if you don't know how to locate them, call me or uh, send me an email, and I will send you their uh, public information office. And they may have programs like that, especially for the elderly, where they can send uh, teams. Um, another thing that we can do, which I think we kind of touched the surface, Evelyn talked about something similar. If we have teams within Epicenter that we get a core of people that are taught some of these things and then if they can volunteer going, especially for elderly or, or people that are of special needs, that we can go there and help them find out where these utilities are or how they can find a way to uh, better situate their homes in the event of, a, of an earthquake or such. And I think, uh, Joelle, you were the one who asked that question. So we know where you live. So we yeah. can make a special visit to your apartment, Joelle. Yeah, we'll go down there and, and, and find out where these utilities are. Awesome. So once a seismic valve is triggered, do you need to call the gas company to reset it? Or can the homeowner reset it? Um, it happens in my house more often than I'd like. Um, Personally, I know how to put it back and I know how to uh, light my, um, my gas, you know, water heater. Uh, my recommendation to you is I don't want to tell you to do it. If you're comfortable, you know what you're doing, you read the manufacturer's uh, pamphlet, then it that depends on you. If you're not, call the gas company. They will come down and they will light those pilots up back for you. So it's a free service, at least most of the gas companies, I'm not sure where everybody lives, but uh, that really is, is dependent on, on your own comfort level and your own knowledge. In my house, I do it because I know what I'm doing, but I, I don't want to profess to tell everybody that they should do it on their own as well. Thank you, Albert. Uh, just a few more questions to go. What sort of foods should you include in a food kit and how often should you expect to replenish it or swap out expired dates? Good question. Um, we stocked up on some canned goods, but I've also invested personally in our house. Costco will have those, those um, 72 hour uh, dehydrated food portions, uh, sometimes uh, referred to as meals ready to eat. Uh, they, depending on where you get them, can have a shelf life of 25 years. So we have some in our house. And uh, what I invested in is I bought these ammo packs because uh, you can stick them in there and I have some of those little absorbent packages in there. And if something falls on them, they're protected. Uh, if we need to get out in our house in a quick way, I can grab them. Pia knows where they're at. Um, so that's another thing you could do if you don't have the funds or you're not certain if you want to make that investment, get some canned goods, but look at the expiration dates. Invest in uh, multiple hand can openers because you may have the electrical ones, but you may be in a situation there's no electricity. And if you have an electric can opener, it's not going to help you. But stuff like that, cereals, canned goods, in our home, we have water barrels that are filled. So uh, some of this stuff we're going to cover, and I'm going to show some of the things that we have. And we'll be able to provide links for those that are interested in uh, investing in some of these, these items. What is the best place to put fire extinguishers and smoke alarms? Um, fire extinguishers, uh, and we're going to cover that at the next class in a lot more detail. Um, we recommend what they call multi-purpose fire extinguisher. That's what they call an ABC extinguisher. Uh, and that will put out regular combustible fires, wood, plastic, uh, fabrics. It will put out electrical fires, computer, television, and whatnot. 
um, but it can also put out some uh, combustible uh, uh, liquids, uh, uh, some uh, grease fire in your home or a uh, cooking fire type thing. So these are the extinguishers that we recommend. Um, in businesses, they have to be adhered to a wall prominently every 75 feet in your home. I would invest in at least two somewhere near your kitchen because that's where the majority of the fires in homes start and somewhere near your garage. Well, it makes a difference if your home has an attached garage or a detached garage. So in our house, we can walk in from our garage into the living room. Some homes have the garage, you have to go outside your house and walk out to the garage. So if you have a, a attached garage and you park your, your cars inside there, I would even invest in three. One inside the garage in the event something happens, you have a car that has gasoline, flammable liquid. So it's important to have one there. I would have one somewhere in the living area, maybe the living room or the den and someone, uh, another one near the kitchen. So we're gonna go into more detail regarding that in the different types of extinguishers. There's special extinguishers for different types of fires. A lot of people think, oh, I can use a water extinguisher. Well, it's a bad mix when you have a flammable liquid and you apply water, you can make it worse. So we'll, we'll talk about that in the next class and about specific extinguishers for specific types of fires. And where do we purchase these extinguishers? We know we'll learn more details next time. Um, yeah. You can the purchase them um, on the Home Depot Center, your Lowell Center. Um, but this is another thing, the California State Fire Marshal's Office will send us different things. There's a lot of extinguishers that are unfortunately from abroad and the quality of the product is highly suspect. Mm -hmm. You wanna make sure, and I'll cover this in the next class, that's a UL rated. Uh, Underwriter Laboratories is a, an agency that tests products in the US that they need to meet minimum standards. Some of these imported items, unfortunately don't have that kind of rating. So my recommendation is if you need to spend an additional 10, $20 for a, an extinguisher or a fire alarm that has a UL rating, or there's other agencies that do these testings that I would spend that extra money rather than getting a product that you are not sure is gonna be dependable or not. Should we always sleep with a door closed? Yeah, that's something we recommend. Um, and I might be able to provide a video in the next class. Uh, simple thing, just keeping your door closed. The fire starts outside. Most people don't realize that the fatalities in fires aren't the fire itself burning somebody. It's the smoke and the contaminated gases and superheated air that will cause these fatalities, fatalities. So even closing your door, it might be uncomfortable. Some of us wanna keep it open, but closing your door can make a difference between you surviving a fire or not. And our next question, uh, already set of where to place smoke alarms and fire extinguishers. Yeah, we talked about the, uh, the fire extinguishers, uh, the areas where I recommend. Uh, make sure that everybody knows where they're at. Uh, businesses, like I said, they're supposed to be anchored to the wall, a uh, specific height. I'll have to, I don't wanna, off the top of my head, I should remember that, but uh, I can give you the, the specific height, but that's only for businesses in the home there's no requirement um, by state law or federal law where you have to place it. Uh, just make sure that it's a place everybody knows um, and that everybody knows how to use it. But we're gonna cover how to use an extinguisher, recommended places and locations of it. And with regards to smoke alarms, we don't wanna place it in the kitchen because that's that smoke mm -hmm. alarm is gonna go off all the time. Uh, some smoke alarms are hardwired as well as a battery backup. So a battery backup would mean that in the event of a power outage, it has a battery backup that will give it the abilities to still activate, even though there's no electricity running through it. Um, but uh, in the bedrooms, hallways, and den, dens are areas that I recommend 
but I also have some paperwork that will give details and recommendations as to the placement of these. So I will send you some of that information so that you can post it on the website. Thank you, Albert. So last question for today's Life View class. Uh, what were the name of some of the tools that you used and where can we buy them, such as the wrench? Yeah, um, so that, that, uh, that gas meter valve, I, I showed you a couple of varieties. We, we can purchase those online. And that particular one that I really like is made from a non-sparking material. So if you hit a rock or you hit another metal, it's not gonna spark like a regular metal type uh, of a wrench. Um, I'll, I'll send you a link where we can make that purchase. But that the one I really like is that water main valve. Um, you can purchase those you have to do, do a little research going online. You can purchase those at Home Depot or, or Lowe's. But um, I've had that one for years. I don't even remember where I bought it, um, probably 17 years ago. Uh, but I'll also look into that and send you a link so that people can have a variety of different places where they can mm -hmm. purchase one. Thank you guys so much, Pia and Albert and everyone who joined. Thank you for sticking around for more Q&A. And we will send a follow-up email of where you can access more of these resources as well as the process to the recording. So we'll also be posting the next uh, Life You class. Evelyn, would you close us out in a word of prayer? Yes. Father, I just thank you for how you fashion each and every one of us. And we thank you for Albert and Pia and for the rest of the leadership team of bringing us all into this to help us to be prepared. Um, these are just helpful, helpful things. And Father, just we thank you for the knowledge and expertise that you've given to them. We just bless them, Lord. Thank you for everyone who's joined on this call. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.